Happy Easter. We welcome you this morning. We hope you'll have a wonderful Resurrection Sunday today. And we've come, of course, to celebrate what the Lord has accomplished for us. We'll ask you to stand and join our choir and orchestra this morning. And just praise the Lord for what he's done. It's my Jesus prayer. Let's all stand and sing. worship service with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we are moved this morning by that love divine, that matchless grace. 
that God should die for men. Father, we come realizing that when we were not seeking after you, when we had no desire to follow you, when we were looking to fulfill our plans, go our own way, you showed a love that drew us to you. You imparted spiritual life when we were spiritually dead so that we, by faith, could receive the gift of eternal life. Why you would do that, we don't know. But that you did that, we praise you for the mercy and grace bestowed upon us. And Father, as we consider this Resurrection Sunday, help us to see that Jesus Christ is our intercessor, the right hand of the Father, the one who bridges the gap between a sinner and a sinless God. And this is possible because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And we look forward to the day when Jesus Christ will come to reign again. Lord, we praise you that this is again possible because of the resurrection. We praise you that we serve a risen Savior. We praise you that this Savior has not left us comfortless, but that for those that have put their faith and trust in him and him alone, he promises them an eternal reward and an eternal place in heaven. We thank you for our risen Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. When we think of Resurrection Sunday, we cannot think of it without talking about the cross of Christ. In fact, the Apostle Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 5, beginning with verse 1, Now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I have preached to you, which you also received, in which you also stand, by which you also are saved, if you hold fast the word which I preached to you, unless you have believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I have also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. That's his cross. And that he was buried and that he rose again or he was raised on the third day according to the scripture. That's the resurrection. When we think of the gospel of Jesus Christ, we have to consider not only the resurrection but also the cross. And this is what I want to do this morning. I want us to consider the cross and the resurrection of our Jesus Christ from a text that that speaks of this but is t- typically not used on a Sunday morning to, to talk about the resurrection. If you have your Bibles, please turn them to Romans chapter 8. If you do not have a Bible, I invite you to use one of the few Bibles that we have before you. This is page 127 in the New Testament. 127. But Romans 8.31. What shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who is against us? As I mentioned, this is a a passage that you wonder, what does it have to do with the resurrection? Well, let's look at the next verse. He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? We read on in verse 33. Who will bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Christ is he who died, yes, rather, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. Now, when we consider the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, what we see here, and to me, this is an exciting thing, the death of Jesus Christ shows that God is for us. Notice what the text tells us. What then shall we say to these things if God is for us, who is against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all. Now, of course, we have to ask this question. 
who is the us in the text? Well, you look at Romans 8.1, we see, therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. The us in Romans 8, 31 and 32 are those who are in Christ. Those who put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ and in Jesus Christ alone. Sola Cristo. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ, Jesus has set us free from the law of sin and death. Now this setting free tells us that the death of Jesus Christ provided something. It provided our redemption. It provided our ransom where we were set free from the curse of sin and the bondage that it brings. Going back to the text in verse 32, he, God, did not spare his own son, but delivered him over. So those that are in Christ are those that, is, that are referred to in verse 32, us. This is Paul and his readers. Now, when we look at this, we observe something that God did for us. What he did is deliver his son over for this redemption, this ransom that we desperately needed. Now, this was part of God's eternal plan to sacrifice his son. In Acts chapter 2, 22, in the sermon of Peter, there at Pentecost, he declares to the Jews, men of Israel, listen to these words, Jesus, the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God, with miracles and wonders and signs which God performed through him in your midst, just as you yourselves know, this man delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God. Now what we see in the text is that God the Father permitted man to crucify his son. Now, if God did not permit this, there was no way that any person in the created order could handle Jesus Christ or could take hold of him. All throughout the Gospels, you see that time after time again, men try to take hold of Jesus, but they were unable to. Pontius Pilate himself, in asking Jesus to, to answer his question concerning this issue of the king, makes this comment. Don't you know that I have the power to crucify you or to release you? And Jesus Christ responds, you have no power against me unless it was given to you from above. This power to torture, to whip me, to crucify me is given to you by God the Father. Now, why is this important we read in Isaiah that it pleased God to bruise him but it also tells in Isaiah that it was for our iniquities for our sins that Jesus was bruised and it's rooted in this simple truth that a holy God demands payment for sin but a loving God provided it. So what we see here is that God is for us and the way that he showed that he was for us is by sparing or is by sacrificing a son, not sparing him so that you and I could have this redemption that is desperately needed. It was part of God's eternal plan to deliver him over for us to provide this redemption and this reconciliation. You see, God is a holy God. God cannot permit sinners in his presence. You say, well, I'm a sinner. I'm in trouble. And the answer is, or the response to that is, you're right. But God provided a means by which your sin, which has alienated you in him your sin to be addressed and that addressing of the sin so that you and I could be reconciled is Jesus Christ 
We look at the redemption. We see that this redemption grants us, from, uh, grants us a freedom from the bondage of sin. We are no longer slaves to sin. Notice what we read in 1 Peter 1.18, knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable, perishable things like a silver and gold from your futile ways of life inherited from your forefathers, but with precious blood as a lamb unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. So you were bought back with a price. So when you look at the cross, you see that, that God is for us and that we were bought with the blood of Jesus Christ. The cross also brings this reconciliation. It brings about a relationship with God. You see, Christianity is not a religion. It is a relationship. Yesterday at our prayer time, the observation was made about an individual who fears religion. And I suggest to you, I fear religion too. <laughs> religion that is the making of one's mind. The religion that is made up by the unregenerate man. The religion that is made up by people who are not in Christ. Any religion that is made up by people who are not in Christ is something to be feared. You see, my Christianity is a relationship because I am in Christ. Notice what Paul tells us. God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against him. And he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. The point being is the cross is a reminder that God redeemed us and reconciled us to himself. So when you look at the cross, understand that God is for you. He sent his son. Didn't spare him. He handed him over so that his son could suffer the penalty of sin for those who are in Christ, for you and me. And when you look at the cross, understand that the cross is the bridge between the sinful man and the sinless God. It reminds us that God redeemed us and reconciled us to himself. But this is all possible because of the resurrection. It's not enough for Jesus Christ to have died. He had to live a life of obedience and then die. And it's not enough for him to stay buried. He had to resurrect from the dead to show that the consequences of sin has been addressed by him. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So as we consider the cross, as we consider the resurrection, understand that the cross, the resurrection, has implications for you and me. You see, the Gospels give us the fact that Jesus Christ resurrected from the dead. It, it gives us the historical aspect, but it is in the epistles that we see the implications. And one of those implications is simply this, that when you look at the cross, you could say, hey, God is for me because he's done for me what no one else could do. Pastor Jim. I want to invite you to join once more with us with our choir and orchestra as we really just praise the Lord for the resurrection and what he's done for us so let's remain seated and this is a hymn that we've learned now for several weeks the resurrection hymn in your black hymn I'll see you what a morning
please join. Behold him rise, the glorious sun. He takes away the sins of the world. Both lamb and priest, God's holy one. He takes away the sins of the world. Lifted up was he to die. It is finished was his cry, now in heaven exalted high, he takes away the sins of the world. For millions hopeless, lost, condemned, he takes away the sins of the world. Through faith we're made alive in him. He takes away the sins of the world. Guilty, vile, and helpless we, spotless Lamb of God was he. Full atonement can it be? He takes away the sins of the world. When he comes, our glorious King, all his wrath. 
ransomed home to bring. Then anew this song we'll sing. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. What a Savior. He takes away, Jesus takes away, he takes away the sins of the Hundred seventy three in your hymnal, Christ the Lord is risen today. So praise the Lord. And I'm going to ask us to stand once more. Let's sing together. Two hundred seventy three. be seated. Amen. We serve a risen Savior. He has risen. And as we continue to consider the text this morning, we observe that the resurrection of Jesus Christ delivers us from condemnation. The resurrection of Jesus Christ shows that God has delivered us from condemnation. Notice here verse 33. Who will bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? 
Jesus Christ is the one who died, yes, rather, who was raised. Now, please understand that the Bible is clear. For the soul that sins, that soul must die. Now, when we talk about death, we're talking about separation. We understand that physical death is the spirit separated from the body. Spiritual death is the person separated from God. This is why it is possible for a person to be physically alive yet spiritually dead. A person could be walking around physically alive, but because they're separated from God, because they have not put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ and in Jesus Christ alone, they're spiritually dead. So what we understand is when a person still in sin fails to embrace Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone, we see that there is the wrath of God abiding on him. Now, when we talk about salvation, we understand that God saves us from our sins. God saves us from the power of Satan. Uh, In a way, God saves us from society and from ourselves. But in the context of sin, really what God is saving us from is the wrath of God. The wrath of God abides on all who practice ungodliness, all who are still in sin. Now, what is the penalty of offending an infinite God, eternal death. For the wages of sin is eternal death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ alone. So the cross and the resurrection of Jesus Christ shows that God has delivered us from condemnation. Now keep in mind, the us are those that are in Christ. That is Paul and his readers, and by implication, all those that put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. Friend, there are people who will tell you that there are many ways to God. If this is true, then Jesus Christ is a liar because he himself said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. And if Jesus Christ was incorrect and inaccurate there, then everything else we read about Jesus Christ, of being our Savior, of being the hope of the world, is false. I suggest to you that he was right on target when he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And as God delivered him over to men to be crucified, Jesus Christ himself said, no man takes my life from me, I freely lay it down. Very familiar passage. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have what? Everlasting life. But God demonstrated his love for us in that while you and I were still sinners, Christ died for us, Romans 5.8. 1 John 4.10. In this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be a propitiation or a atoning sacrifice for our sins. So that when Juan Marino received Jesus Christ, and now I am in Christ, God sees me the only way he can in Jesus Christ. You see, you have a righteous God on one side. Everything he is conforms to everything he does. Here's Juan Marina on the other side. In order for me to ever have any hope of abiding with him, I have to be righteous. The scales are like this. Now, I could think, and I could think that, hey, by all my good works, I could kind of balance the scale, but guess what? If from the day I was born to the day I died, all I did was righteous deeds, the scale would still be tipped. Why? Because I was born in iniquity and in sin, my mother conceived me. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercies, he what? Saved us. For by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of your works, so that no one could boast. So here are the scales. But guess who stands on my side when I by faith receive him as personal Lord and Savior? Jesus Christ. So then the scales are balanced. 
And I could say with the Apostle Paul, I stand before God not having my own righteousness, but the righteousness that is found in Jesus Christ. And notice what the text tells us. It is God who justifies. Because God looked at Juan Marino and said, you are justified because you received my son as personal Lord and Savior. I will no longer hold you liable for sin, liable for punishment. And if God says not guilty, guess what? There's no higher court to appeal to, right? <laughs> he is the supreme of the supreme court. <laughs> if God says no longer liable for punishment, that settles it. But he could only say that because of the cross work of Jesus Christ. What we see here is that the resurrection of Jesus Christ testifies that those who put their trust in him are no longer liable for punishment. Notice, yes, rather, who was raised, who is at the right hand, who also intercedes for us. Now, if Christ did not rise from the dead, then let me suggest to you that we are still liable for our sins. In fact, this is what the Apostle Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians, that if Christ has not raised from the dead, or, uh, raised from the dead, then Christ himself is still dead. 1 Corinthians 15, 13, but if there's no resurrection of the dead, not even Christ has been raised. So, so I am proclaiming a message of a dead Savior. Now, a Savior who is dead, and I guess we could cry like those who were around the cross, he says he could save others, but he cannot save himself. The preaching of the cross, the preaching of Jesus Christ, is meaningless. Faith in Jesus Christ is vain. Paul and the apostles are liars. And the New Testament is written by a bunch of liars. If Christ is dead, because each of them proclaimed that Jesus Christ has resurrected from the dead. Now notice the personal implications. If Christ is still dead, if he has not been raised, we are still in our sins. 1 Corinthians 15, 17. And those that profess salvation and have died, those who have accepted Jesus Christ as personal Lord and Savior and have passed on, they have perished. Then those who also have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. And notice what it tells us here, that, that we are to be pitied if Christ has not raised from the dead. If we have hope in Christ in this life only, we are of all men most to be pitied. But I love verse 20, 1 Corinthians 19:20. But now Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who are asleep. He resurrected from the dead to show I have conquered sin's penalty death. And all those who have, will put their faith and trust in me and me alone will likewise conquer the penalty of sin through faith in Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. Because of the cross and the resurrection, I love this, we have an eternal intercessor. Jesus Christ. Christ Jesus is he who died. Verse 34, yes, rather who was raised and at the right hand of God who also intercedes for us. Now how long will Jesus Christ intercede for you and me? for all eternity. Keep in mind that Jesus Christ is the God-man. He is kind of the asbestos shield between a holy God and sinful man. You see, as man, he could relate to me. As God, he could relate to the Father. As the God-man, he is the shield. Who could see God? What does the Bible tell us? No man has seen God at any time. The only begotten God, who is Jesus Christ, who 
is that the bosom of the Father, he has declared him. And this is why the Hebrew writer tells us that Jesus Christ's priesthood is an eternal one. He will eternally be my priest. Hebrews 4, 7, 4, uh, 14, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. Hebrews 10, 19, Therefore, brethren, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, we could go through the very throne room of God because of the blood of Jesus Christ. He is our intercessor. He is our high priest. We need no earthly priests. In a real way, we hold to the priesthood of every believer. There is no mediator between us and God in the human sense, but there is the man, Christ Jesus, the God-man, who stands the gap. And we go on. This is a new and living way, which he inaugurated for us through the veil, that is, his flesh. As a result of Jesus Christ dying, we see the veil was rent from top to bottom. We see this in the, uh, the, 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 the records of the Gospels of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. From top to bottom shows us that the one that's doing the tearing is God himself. He is saying, no more will you need the high priest to have access to me. All you need is Jesus Christ. When you are in Christ, you have access to the Father. Since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a sincere heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Hebrews 9.24, For Christ did not enter a holy place made by hands, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Think about it. I don't have to confess my sin to any man but to God. Now, I have to confess my sin when I wrong a brother. But my high priest is Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. Who are those who are no longer on their sin's penalty, who are served by Christ's intercessory Ministry, we talked about this earlier, those that are in Christ. In verse 9 of Romans 8, those that are in the Spirit of God and the Spirit dwells in them. But notice in the immediate text in Romans 8, 28, and we know that God causes all things to work together for the good of those who love God. Uh, we see that these things work for those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. Those who have a special interest in God, those who are fulfilling his purpose. Now notice, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. Who are the, the, who are the us? Those who are willing to be conformed to the image of his son. There are those who profess Jesus Christ who have no desire to be conformed to the image of his son. We have to ask ourselves, are they really God's children? There are people here that grew up in this church who profess Jesus Christ by way of religion, but have no relationship with him. You have to ask yourself, if they have no desire to be conformed to the image of Christ, if they have no desire to fellowship with those who are in Christ, are they really of Christ? And this is what the Hebrew writer tells us of those who apostatized, who said they were in Christ, but they fall away. I heard a great great testimony this morning. Micah Bryson came up to me. Of course, he gave me permission to say this. Micah Bryson, one of the sons of Pastor Tony, said, Pastor Marino, I just want to share with you that last Wednesday night, I accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior. Micah, was raised in a Christian home. Micah attended a Christian school all his life. Micah was in church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. And he came to the reality that my Jesus up to that point was just a religion. 
I had no relationship with them. And he received the gift of eternal life. This is the same story of Jason Norick, the same story of Nathan Burns, all of them raised in churches like ours. But there are others raised in the same context who when they're of age, when they start developing their own philosophy of life, view the assembly as irrelevant, view the fellowship, those that are in Christ, as unimportant, could honestly believe that they could, could disconnect with those that are the bride of Christ and insist that they're still in Christ. Notice what it says. Those who are elect, chosen, those who are called, those who are justified, glorified, those who are being conformed into the image of Jesus Christ. And the resurrection of Jesus Christ permits something to happen here. It permits Jesus Christ to intercede for you and for me before the throne of God above. We serve a risen Savior. So God is for those who are in Christ and have the Spirit. Because of this, he has a special interest in those people, those people who are conforming into the image of his Son, those people who he has justified, he will one day glorify at his second coming. Friend, if you have never turned from your sin and trusted Jesus Christ, he invites you to receive the gift of eternal life. He's calling you to turn from your sin that is condemning you and has condemned you and turn to Jesus Christ, the one who stands the gap, the one who offers this redemption that in turn will cause God to acquit you and to begin conforming you into the image of Jesus Christ. Notice the promise that is given to us in the text. He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? If he gave us his son, he's going to give us all things. This is why the church true believers in Jesus Christ become part of the bride of Christ. We become joint heirs with him. We are uh, uh, we'll be co-regents with him. That is we will rule with him. And the cross reminds us that God is for all those who are in Christ and trust his son. He's for you. He's for me. He sent his son to die on the cross. He's provided a new and living way. And the resurrection is a testimony of that. That's Jim. Let's remain seated, but continue to sing triumphantly to the Lord, 265, that Christ arose. All right, remain seated and join us. 265.
Amen. In conclusion, we see by way of review, the cross shows that God is for us. The resurrection delivers us from the consequences and the condemnation of sin. But notice here, the cross and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and to me this is an exciting thing, establishes an inseparable relationship between God and us. Notice with me, please, the text, verse 35. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Verse 37. But in all these things we are overwhelmingly conquerors through him who loved us. And notice Paul's conviction because of the risen Savior, because of the cross, because the cross for Paul shows, hey, God's for me. God's for you. The cross shows that there's no condemnation. This is Paul's conviction. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of Christ, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord, which is in Christ Jesus alone. So, because I am in Christ, I don't have to fear. Yes, the world may bring its challenges. People may persecute me. People may say certain things about you. But because you are in Christ, those things will never, ever separate you from the love of Christ, love of God. The cross and the resurrection reminds us that God did not spare his son, but delivered him over to die. That in dying, Jesus Christ paid the penalty for our sins, providing the redemption and reconciliation that is needed. That God is pleased with those who trust Jesus Christ and have the Spirit. The cross reminds us that God is conforming his children into the image of his Son. It is a reminder that we have been justified and one day will be glorified. The cross and the resurrection is a reminder of that inseparable link between the believer and God's love. And because of the resurrection, we have Jesus Christ inter interceding for you and me but also because of the resurrection. It enables him to come a second time to rule. To me, this is exciting. I'm going to deviate slightly from the order of service. I'm going to ask us all to stand and sing hymn 115 in our hymns, Modern and Ancient, The Power of the Cross. Right before we take our offering, I want us to sing praise to God for the cross and what he's done for us as we sing all these verses, the power of the cross. Oh, to see the dawn of the darkest day Christ and the
You may be seated. We prepare to take our Easter offering. For those that are members here, the First Baptist Church of Lake Orion, you know what the Easter offering is going towards. It's going really to the general operations here of this ministry. You know the need. We trust that you prayerfully consider what to give during this time. And for you that are visiting with us, don't feel compelled to give. This is really for our congregation. We praise the Lord for what he's doing here in our midst and what he continues to do. And I ask one of our deacons, Marvin Maupin, to come and ask the Lord's blessing as we prepare to worship God with this offering. Let's pray. Dear Holy Father, our hearts rejoice this morning as we celebrate the resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, and our Savior. Father, as we come to this time and in our worship service to uh, take our, our offerings and, and our tithes. Father, we just pray that we give with glad hearts, realizing, Father, that all we have comes from you. Father, we thank you for sending your son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for our sins and to provide salvation to all who believe. Father, we just pray that all we've said and done here today brings glory and honor to you. For it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
let's all stand for a closing word of prayer, after which I'm going to have Pastor Jim come and lead us in a song. Now, those who have been saved for quite some time know the song. For those who have not, it may be new to you, but it's an old song. Maybe the song is not as old as I think it is, but we're going to sing victory in Jesus because of the cross work of Jesus Christ. Let us close with that. But let's bow in a closing word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for Jesus Christ. We thank you that when we were helpless and hopeless, that you sent Jesus Christ to die for our sins. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And Lord, we know that there is a new and living way because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ that we could stand before your throne. Lord, we know that at times Satan will indeed bring and level his charges against us, but that condemnation does not matter because there is no condemnation to them who are in Christ. And while we need to live a life in step with the Spirit, we thank you that we have the Spirit to help us. And we thank you for the resurrection of your wonderful Savior we could leave this place understanding the victory we have in Jesus Christ and in Jesus Christ alone. For it's in his name we pray. Amen. Pastor Jim. You'll find victory in Jesus 587. If you want to follow in our hymnal, please. 587. I heard an old, old story of a Savior King for glory. How he gave his life on Calvary to save a much like me. I heard about his glory, of his precious blood's unto me. Easter. Behold our Maker pierced and dying. He takes away the sins of the world. He bears our shame without replying. He takes away the sins of the world. Man of sorrows, what a name. For the Son of God who came, ruin sinners to reclaim, He takes away the sins of the world. Behold Him rise, the glorious Son, 